And let's go on your slideshow here and we can get started. There we go, whoops. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Eleanor Rangers. I'm the president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. We are a 501c3 organization dedicated to preserving the memories of those who created it. Uh, we started out in 2010, collecting oral histories of people who were involved in Cold War related activities in the Southeastern Pennsylvania area. Uh, and we continue with that endeavor today and have expanded into doing some uh, additional historical preservation uh, locally. Um, just a reminder to everyone, um, if you could kindly mute your microphones and turn off your cameras for the presentation, uh, just so we can preserve a, enough bandwidth, uh, you know, for the presentation, uh, we would sincerely appreciate it. But uh, when we get to Q&A, uh, we certainly don't have a problem with you unmuting and turning on your cameras. Uh, this is the History in Our Backyard webinar series. We were formerly a live program that was uh, conducted in Warminster at the old Johnsville Centrifuge. Due to the pandemic, we decided to go virtual and these uh, probably will remain an indefinite part of our, our uh, monthly educational offerings, but we're hoping uh, later this year and into 2023 to start reintroducing some selective live programming. So more to come on that. I uh, also wanted to mention for those of you online who are former employees of the Naval Air Development Center uh, from uh, located in Warminster. We are going to be having an open house and reunion uh, in August, August 21st from noon to five. Uh, it's um, uh, you know an opportunity just to kind of get together. We actually sort of missed the last five year increment for uh, a reunion um, back in, I guess it was 2021. So uh, we thought it was an opportunity just to get folks together uh, in 2022. Again, very informal. We'll probably have some limited displays set up or, you know, we may already, have, we may have a guest speaker actually. Um, and you'll have a chance to sample the new brew pub that is opened at the Centrifuge. Um, I had a chance to uh, uh, check it out last week. It's a, it's a very nice venue. So uh, we will probably have more uh, specifics uh, coming in July, but uh, please uh, hold that on your calendar if you're if you're in the area and it's open to families. So please bring family friends. Uh, also, just want to put that plug in that donations are always welcome to our organization. We are a very small, modest 501c3, and donations, um, you know, are again always welcome for some of the limited uh, activities that uh, we're involved with. Um, one of those activities that I do want to mention is uh, we were recently granted a room, a small room at the Fuge, uh, actually, uh, that we call the map room because it has a very large world map on the wall. Um, but we're going to be converting that into a display room, probably dedicated to the Naval Air Development Center history. Uh, we've, you know, some of you may have seen a survey that went out uh, to former employees of NADC to, to get some idea of priorities for displays. So we have a pretty good idea of what we want to start with. And we have a fair fair number of things that we can actually put into the room at this point. So we are in the planning process for that. I know a couple of people have reached out with offers to help with uh, creating uh, the displays for that room. And I've been a little behind getting back with you, but uh, that is uh, something that I want to get kicked off formally uh, very soon. So uh, more to come on that as well. Um, just a reminder again, uh, I, I did switch over to a new email distribution system, MailChimp, to send out uh, announcements. Started that at the beginning of this year, so hopefully uh, everyone's kind of switched over and you're getting my emails if you're on our email distribution list. If you're not, um, just, uh, you know, please check your junk folders, spam folders to see if, if that's where my emails may be heading. I try not to send too many of them out. Usually the emails I tend to send out, send out are two weeks and then the week of uh, the events and then of course the day day of events. So I, I, I do try to minimize the number of emails that are sent out uh, from our organization. Um, and also uh, we do <clears throat> we do also uh, record these webinars. Um, so they are available for on-demand viewing uh, following the conclusion of these events. I try to get them up the same night and uh, you can see it's a screenshot of our YouTube channel that we maintain. And uh, I do try to uh, keep that updated with other types of offerings that I 
find in my, uh, you know, perusing the, the web with uh, new Cold War related videos. So there's always some interesting content there uh, that's worth checking out. Uh, and if any of you are on Facebook, we do have a Facebook page where I do try to, um, you know, have our events listed there. And I do try to post some interesting stories uh, that I do come across that are Cold War related on there as well. Um, also want to mention next month, um, and actually I believe our guest speaker is online this evening joining us from Arizona, um, John Ramirez, who worked for the CIA, uh, is going to be speaking about electronic uh, cold warriors in Happy Value, Valley, i.e. Penn State, um, and of which I think some, of, some people on the line are uh, alumni of. But uh, and we've had an interest in, in hearing more stories, cold, other broader Cold War related topics. So I was delighted to uh, actually become acquainted with John and uh, he's a wealth of information, very much looking forward to this presentation and hopefully other topics uh, in the future. Um, again, just a reminder about muting your microphones and please turning off your cameras uh, for the presentation. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers. And then we do have one other sort of interim commentary that uh, George is going to do on Apollo 1 on the memorial at Arlington uh, that was just dedicated. Uh, and then we'll get, get started with uh, the formal presentation this evening. So first let me introduce Andy Saunders. So Andy is a British author, science writer, and one of the world's foremost experts of NASA digital restoration. His photographic work has been exhibited internationally at some of the most renowned venues and regularly makes headlines in the world press, including the BBC, CBS, uh, the Daily Telegraph, New York Times, USA Today, Smithsonian Magazine, Fox News, Discover Magazine, and the Washington Post, among others. His remastered images have also been utilized by NASA and reside in their own archives. In 2019, he produced the clearest ever image of Neil Armstrong on the moon for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. He went on to reveal life on board the stricken Apollo 13 mission and in 2021 found Alan Shepard's golf ball on the lunar surface. I didn't know this. This is news to me, Andy. Finally revealing how far the miles and miles shot went half a century after the, after the event. So maybe we could talk about that at the conclusion of your talk this evening. Yeah. Um, Andy is also a regular contributor to science-based media and appears on TV, radio, and as a guest speaker at events like this to discuss the history of spaceflight, photography, and digital image enhancement and restoration. His book, Apollo Remastered, of which you can see an image here on the screen featuring the highest quality Apollo photographs ever produced, is coming out here in the U.S. in October of 2022, and I guess in, in September in the U.K., is that correct, Andy? That is, yeah. Okay. Uh, and it is available for pre-order now. So uh, definitely I would encourage everyone to go out right away and, and buy a book. And um, that would be fantastic. I'm sure Andy would, would love that. All right, so let's introduce um, George Leopold. So George is a veteran journalist and science and technology writer. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in history from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and a master's degree in German, journalism from Columbia University. He has written extensively about U.S. manned spaceflight, including the Apollo and Space Shuttle programs, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Scientist, and a variety of other science and technology publications. <clears throat> George is actually uh, Gus Grissom's official biographer, having published Calculated Risk, The Life and Supersonic Times of Gus Grissom in 2016. Unlike other American astronauts, Virgil I. Gus Grissom never had the chance to publish his memoirs. Killed along with his crew in a launch pad fire on January 27, 1967, Grissom also lost his chance to walk on the moon and to return to describe that journey. But fortunately, George has been able to bring Gus's life to life. And as you can see with this image we have here from October 2019 in Warminster, George had the opportunity to regale us about George's about uh, Gus's life and talk about his book. Uh, which uh, was certainly a memorable event and actually was one of the last live events that we did uh, in what I call the pre-times before, <laughs> before the pandemic. Yes. But, yes. but uh, hopefully we'll be able to return to live events uh, as I kind of mentioned uh, previously. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to George to talk about the Apollo 1 monument dedication that happened at Arlington in June. Okay, 
Thank you, Eleanor. It's great to be back. Uh, this this past June 2nd, uh, 55 years after the launch pad fire that killed the crew of Apollo 1, a monument to the crew was at long last dedicated at Arlington National Cemetery. Lowell Grissom, Bonnie White Bear, and Cheryl Chaffee and their families laid wreaths at the new monument. And they were accompanied by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, who led the ceremony near the graves of Apollo 1 Commander Gus Grissom and pilot Roger Chaffee. Uh, Charlie Bolden, a former NASA Administrator, also attended, as did Nelson's deputy, Bob Cabana, who played a central role in mounting a permanent Apollo 1 exhibit at the Kennedy Space Center that opened, uh, that was debuted in the 50th anniversary of the fire. As Lowell Grissom noted, the monument was a long time coming. It literally took a uh, act of Congress to get this done. Uh, it represented Edie Bernice Johnson, the chairwoman of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, introduced a resolution several years ago. But when that didn't go anywhere, Representative Johnson attached an amendment to the fiscal 2018 defense authorization bill, which is among the few pieces of spending le legislation that's sure to pass Congress each year. Her amendment uh, authorized the monument, but it didn't fund it. So the aerospace industry groups took up the cause and eventually uh, passed the baton to the Challenger Center based here in DC. And Lance Bush and his team at the Challenger Center pushed the project across the finish line, getting a scale down design through the US Commission of the Fine Arts. And by the way, the commission rejected the initial design uh, preferred by the Grissom, White, and Chaffee families, which is sort of another example of the fraud history of Apollo 1. But the primary cost of something like this, a monument, is perpetual care, and the Aerospace Industries Association got some of its members to kick in to cover those expenses. Um, I'm told that the Challenger and Columbia Memorials at Arlington took about a year to be approved and installed. And the Apollo 1 monument, of, uh, of course, took 55 years. So I guess better late than never. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, very pleased to get that done. And uh, the, the, the families uh, seem to be satisfied with the way things turned out. So I guess, uh, Eleanor, we can now go back 60 years to the earliest days of the, of the space race and, and the height of the Cold War competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Yeah, that sounds good. So, um, you know, again, I was just flipping through a couple of photographs that, um, you know, were taken by NASA um, of the event. And I just wanted to conclude with this, um, this uh, particular one um, that um, I think actually, George, you had posted online um, and you had pointed out and I put the arrow there that you can see in the upper portion of the image. Uh, the memorial is not that far from uh, Gus and Betty Grissom's uh, right. site. Right. It's it's located in Section 3, which is a reserved area of Arlington Cemetery for, for aviation pioneers. The first person buried there was Thomas Selfridge, who was killed with Orville Wright uh, when they were doing a demonstration for the Army. Um, so uh, Gus and Roger are buried there. Uh, Jim Irwin, a moonwalker. Uh, um, uh, Don uh, Isley, who would have been on the Apollo 1 crew had he not been injured in, in a training accident. And most recently, a couple of rows back uh, from this photograph, John Young has, has been interred over the last year or so. So uh, significant because John Young was the only astronaut to ever fly in space with Gus Grissom. Oh, that's right. That's right, on Gemini 3. Right, right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and stop sharing and we're going to turn things over to Andy and George to talk about the main, the main highlight for this evening. Did static electricity knock us, Chris, and blow the hatch on Liberty Bell 7? So let me stop sharing and I'm going to turn over the uh, floor to Andy. And again, as a reminder while we're doing this, if you could please mute your lines, uh, very much would appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Eleanor. Okay, so um, today what we'd like to cover, I mean, you've given a very nice introduction there. Thanks for that, Eleanor, um, about the 
George and myself. Uh, and then George will talk a little bit about the supersonic life and times of Gus Grissom. That's a little play on words for his super biography that you've highlighted before, that he's talked about with you before. And then Liberty Bell 7 in terms of the mission, the recovery, how should the recovery have happened? How, what actually happened? I think a lot of us are aware what happened, but why? And what was the impact of, of what happened? The aftermath, the, this mystery around the hatch, the myth that's continued really for 60 years um, about what actually happened and how Grissom was portrayed uh, in the media, in popular culture, in movies such as The Right Stuff. And then we'll look at static electricity and whether that is the explanation of least resistance. So there's been numerous explanations being put forward, possibilities to what happened, whether Gus panicked and hit the chicken switch. We don't think so, but that's how, that how it was portrayed and it has been portrayed before. Um, was it an accident? Did he accidentally hit the plunger? Did the lanyard uh, get pulled by some, the parachute lines? And static electricity is, is something that it's kind of, all of these explanations kind of hit the buffers for various reasons. And we've never really got any of them, kind of any extra evidence or anything across the line with any of them. It's just, it's one of perhaps the most enduring mysteries of the early space race. So we'll discuss the possibility of static electricity and by way of some new evidence, which is some new photographic analysis. Um, and then we'll discuss the conclusions. So we've already been introduced. So a bit of background on Gus, I'll hand over to George at the stage. Okay, well, let me give you the, 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 the quick five minute version of Gus's life. Uh... Born in 1926 in a small town in southern Indiana, sort of the kind of town that <laughs> you'd want to get out of as, as soon as uh, you were old enough. Uh, Gus graduates from high school and he immediately, and, and this is near as the war in Europe is winding down, he joins the Army Air Corps but ends up flying a desk because they've just got too many pilots, but he does qualify for the uh, GI Bill and decides uh, that he doesn't want to stay in Mitchell and in Mitchell, Indiana and put doors on buses and then rolls with his new bride, Betty, at Purdue University. He gets through Purdue in three and a half years, gets a mechanical engineering degree, gets recruited into this uh, new branch of the services called the Air Force. And the next thing he knows, he's in Korea getting shot at as a wingman. Um, and he flew 100 combat missions over Korea and uh, possessed a trait that was highly valued. He was reliable. And he signed up for 25 more flights. And they said, no, you're going to go home and train pilots, uh, which turned out he found to be almost as dangerous as aerial combat. So he comes back to the U.S. He's still in the Air Force. He's going to make a career out of it. He's, he's getting more hours on jet fighters. And he goes oh, to write pad, he gets a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. And then the next logical step for these guys who are used to flying high performance aircraft is to go out to the test pilot school at, at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And he's in the class of uh, 56D. And in his class is a future, another future astronaut and a Gus's future failed business partner, Gordon Cooper. So the two of them are uh, uh, get assigned to various bases, and Gus is happy as a clam, testing gadgets back at Wright Pat Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. When he gets a call from um, the Pentagon to report for a meeting uh, that's top secret, and he's supposed to wear civilian clothes, and he's curious, so he figures he's going to go. And it turns out he's being recruited for this thing called Project Mercury. And he's a little bit skeptical at first because, uh, for one thing, it would sort of put your career at risk. And he's at this point, he's a captain, he's on his way up. Um, but initially, a lot of these guys thought that this was a stunt, putting a guy on top of a rocket. But of course, all that changes when Yuri Gagarin goes up in April of 61, and we've got a space race on our hands. So 
Gus decides to give it his best shot. He's very impressed with these guys. This guy, John Glenn, has broken the speed record across the U.S. And some of these guys are landing aircraft on, yeah, on carriers at night. And um, I, I've never been able to get any NASA officials to say it, but it, it appeared that when they selected the seven astronauts, they they spread it out two air force two navy and a, and and a marine corps actually three air force two navy um and a, and a marine corps guy so gus gets selected primarily uh i think for two reasons great engineering ability and he was five foot seven which turns out comes in pretty handy when you get shoehorned into a spacecraft as small as a mercury spacecraft um so um there's a peer review vote among the among the Mercury astronauts, and three guys emerge as the likely first American in space: uh, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, and, and John Glenn. And of course, that's the way it unfolded. Shepard uh, gets beat by Gagarin, but he's the first American in space. And then Gus Grissom is scheduled to essentially repeat Shepard's flight in July of 1961. The difference between the two flights is that Gus will have a large trapezoid window and he can do some rudimentary um, navigation stuff while he's weightless for about five, five minutes. He's also got a little bit more control in his, on his autopilot. And the other thing that's significant, of course, is this spacecraft, Liberty Bell 7, has an exploding hatch. And this was something that the astronauts asked for. It was a quick way to get out, to punch out if you had to. Um, in, in our research, Annie and I discovered that there was um, not a lot of time spent developing and, and implementing the hatch. It was, it, you could argue that it wasn't really man-rated, man-rated as they said back then. Um, to, to fly. And the, the training tended to focus primarily on getting the astronaut up and down. And the recovery procedures, which are critical here, of course, sort of got short shrift. And it, it appears to us that Gus Grissom was, was familiar with how uh, uh, the hatch worked, but he didn't spend a lot of time, you know, studying background. And, you know, the, the guy loved machines and he wanted to know how every part of the spacecraft worked, but but nobody was really giving a lot of thought to the end of the flight. Once you splash down and the recovery team is going to come in and pick you up, the scenario was that Gus flies a ballistic trajectory. You know, everything goes pretty much as planned. He, he comes down, he's pulling about 10 Gs on the way down. His drogue chute deploys on time. His main chutes come out. And he hits the water about 50 minutes after launch on July 21st, 1961. So he's about 300 miles out in the Atlantic. Um, he writes the ship. He deploys his recovery aids. And the recovery aids include a die marker so that the, 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 the four helicopters, the two recovery helicopters can spot him from a distance. And he deploys a beacon, it's called a Sarah beacon. And most importantly for, for the scenario we're gonna discuss, he deploys a 16 foot high whip antenna. It's an HF antenna, which he uses to communicate with the two recovery helicopters. And part of the uh, procedure on the recovery was that because this thing is very long and we'll, we'll show you a picture of it, um, the the uh, pilot Jim Jim Lewis and his co-pilot John Reinhardt, they have to come in very close uh, as uh, and, and clip that whip, whip antenna with what with what was known as a cookie cutter. It was a squib actuated cutter that would snip the antenna, and that would allow Lewis to come down. Uh, Reinhardt could reach down with a shepherd so hook onto the spacecraft. Uh, Gus would blow the hatch, and then they would lower a, a horse collar, and, and Gus would climb out of the spacecraft and get in the in the uh, horse collar and get hauled back to the USS Randolph, which was a couple of miles away. That's what was supposed to happen, and this is what we think happened, and why the hatch blew 
prematurely. And Andy's uh, remarkable imagery, uh, we think, points in the direction of electrostatic discharge. So Gus is in the water. He, he was in the water for about 11 minutes from splash down to the point where the hatch blows. So he disconnects himself from his restraints. He disconnects his, his oxygen. The only connection he's got left is through his helmet mic so he can talk to the recovery guys. And he's pretty much on schedule. He asked for a few minutes to uh, before they hook on for him to uh, mark his, uh, uh, his switch settings. This was just part of the procedure. So he's in pretty good shape. And the procedure would have been for him to wait for Reinhard to clip the antenna and hook on with a shepherd's hook and lift the spacecraft out of the water until the sill of the hatch was above the water line. But because, again, because they weren't practicing this a lot, uh, Gus got a little ahead and he wanted to be ready when they came in. And so he wanted to be prepared. So what happened was he reached up towards the hatch on his right side, it was above him. And that's where the, the detonator was. And arming the hatch to explode required him to remove a cap. And there was a plunger inset inside of the, the detonator and he removed a cotter pin that armed the hatch. And it required about five pounds of pressure uh, on the plunger to blow the hatch. So he's sitting there, as he said, minding my own business. He knows that the recovery helicopter Hunt Club One is right over him. And all of a sudden the hatch pops and he sees blue sky and water is pouring in. So he gets out and as Andy's footage will show you, show you and this, and I would note that this is, was never seen before until Andy did this work. Uh, you, you see Gus Grissom assisting and helping John Reinhardt to hook on but eventually Lewis loses his tug of war. Uh, the, the spacecraft's got about 3000 pounds of extra weight because of the water. He's trying to drain the, the, the landing bags, but it doesn't work. He gets a uh, warning light on his dash saying, your engine's gonna go in, a five minute, in about five minutes. So they, decide, they make the decision to cut the Liberty Bell 7 loose. Uh, at this point, Gus is fighting to keep his nose above water another a backup recovery helicopter comes in and throws down a horse collar. And the result is this iconic image you see of Gus Grissom hanging like a dead fish backwards in a horse collar, getting holed up on the backup helicopter, but it, he didn't drown. Later, he said he admitted during a press, uh, press conference that he was scared. And this was misinterpreted by the press. He was afraid of drowning. Nobody would have been uh, uh, picked, selected for the Mercury program if they were afraid of flying. That, 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 that's a myth, it didn't happen. Gus Grissom did not hit the chicken switch. There's no indication of any panic in the air to ground communications or the communications with the helicopter. He's going down his checklist and he's doing what he's supposed to do. And you know, I always argue when I argued when I was at the Fuge two years ago, why would he panic? If anything, he would have been relieved to have flown a ballistic trajectory, pulled 10 Gs on the way down. Uh, again, relief, not panic. So um, what's next, Andy? What's the next slide? I think we got some pictures showing what I've been talking about. There's, there's the spacecraft. You can see the 16 foot whip antenna that's deployed. Uh, and, and these shots are being taken by I, we think Dean Conger on a on a on a, a backup helicopter. So these are very long shots, most of them into the sun. And Andy's got to figure out how to remove all of the noise from these images to show you what we're about to show you. You can see John Reinhard. I think at this point he's got the shepherd's hook out, but you can yeah. see he's he's right over the spacecraft and and he's he did manage to hook on with Gus's help before they lost this tug of war. So uh, do we have anything else, Andy, before no, you- No, just, just if you could set up, you know, the 
what led you to believe that electrostatic discharge could yeah, be yeah right the key point the yeah, scenario was, and exactly. your your so, thought so, with Rick Booson. So, so Reinhardt's got to come in with this squib cutter, right? And and luckily he's got the antenna uh, in the yoke, and as he reaches down and makes contact with this ungrounded spacecraft, he sees an arc, and the and the squibs go off by themselves. He does manage to cut the whip antenna and the next thing he sees is the hatch comes flying off and then a few seconds later Gus Grissom manages to get out of the uh, spacecraft before it fills up with water um, and there the scenario that we're presenting here it differs from what Jim Lewis the only person the only eyewitness who's still with us what he recalled and when he viewed Andy's work he revised his story. And what we're arguing is that electrostatic discharge, that arc contributed to the hatch prematurely blowing because the the hatch had been uh, the, the hatch had been uh, the detonator had been armed. Um, it was designed to blow well, the, the, the 69 titanium bolts were weakened and designed to blow when he hit, hit when that plunger was hit. So uh, we don't think that Gus accidentally bumped it. Uh, there's no indication from, from what we've gone through that we see that uh, it was just sort of a case of a lack of training in the recovery procedures and unfamiliarity with a key piece of equipment on the spacecraft. So um, how does this scenario play out? Here's, here's what, we, you know, what we think happened based on Andy's work restoring the original footage and what we think we see and what, what we think we see is a connection between this arc and the hatch going off. Super. Thank you, George. So George contacted me a couple of years ago now originally to look at well, he just asked, would you like to have a look at the recovery footage from Liberty Bell 7? Because he was aware of some of the work I'd, I'd done on Apollo and some other pieces of film. And I was a little bit dubious because I'd seen the quality of film previously. I knew that we tried to have people are trying to find the hatch before. Um, it's low quality film. So I was a little bit dubious, but I thought, OK, let's let's take a look. And, and the first job really was to get some better film. So to get, it's very important to start with the highest quality source footage to do any, any kind of work like this. And it took us quite a while. We had lockdown. We couldn't get anything from the National Archives. But eventually, um, I managed to track down a, a HD transfer of that original recovery film from a guy called Stephen Slater, who's an archive producer. He worked on the Apollo 11 movie. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, so he very generously supplied us with this with this high quality footage. And undertaking anything analysis like this is very important to be completely objective, to treat it almost like a, a piece of science, if you like. Uh, as a space fan, deep down, I would like the answer to, to confirm what a lot of us suspect that, you know, that something else was caused this hatch to blow. As Gus said, we believe him. Um, but it's obviously very important doing this type of analysis to be to get that out of your mind, to be completely objective, and to try not to see something that isn't there. And you can stir at images, particularly low quality images, long enough, and I've done it, and you can start to see things that aren't actually there. So to try and look at it completely objectively. And like I say, the, the first task really was to, can we find the moment that the hatch blows? That's absolutely key. We've never seen this before. So, to do that, I used this high quality film. I did some enhancements on the film and I basically went through frame by frame looking for any kind of movement around the capsule. Some of the kind of digital processing techniques I applied, and I'll talk about some of these a bit later, upscaling, image stabilization, which was crucial because this was filmed by from a hel helicopter and the spacecraft was bobbing in the ocean. So there's a lot of movement. So just to stabilize the image is, is a really important starting point. Some artifact removal, this is very old film, um, can have bits of dust and all kinds of things on it that can confuse your eye. So to try and take out artifacts that we know are definitely artifacts. 
some basic contrast and levels adjustment and something that's not particularly basic, which is this image stacking technique, which is something I applied on the Neil Armstrong image when I produced that. Uh, I use that a lot in the book and it's a really, really powerful technique as we'll see as we go through the analysis. So this is um, a key moment in the recovery. This is Hunt Club 1. The recovery hel helicopter is obviously quite close to Liberty Bell 7. But what you notice from this single frame is we're a long way from the action. It shot into the sun. I mean, it couldn't be, it couldn't be worse because everything we're interested in is in silhouette. So there's very little detail. You can, I don't know if it comes across on Zoom. Like I say, this is 60 millimeter film, all, old film, all kinds of artifacts on there. And like I say, it's filmed from, we think by Dean Conger of National Geographic in a third helicopter. Um, and he, like I say, the helicopter's moving and the spacecraft is bobbing in the ocean. So when we zoom in, that's accentuated. And to try and isolate anything and see any kind of movement is very difficult. So that was the first job is let's stabilize the camera, let's stabilize the footage, let's stabilize and isolate the capsule so that we can then see if there is any movement, anything we can see is, is relative to that capsule. So what you're going to see is stabilized footage. I've enhanced it in that I've increased that contrast, the light to light, the dark to darker to try and enable me to see anything at all. So I went through this frame by frame and all I found was the moment you're about to see. But what we do see is it's quite importantly, it's in 17 consecutive frames. So if what we were looking at was film artifacts or noise, you typically see that on one frame, not on 17 consecutive frames. And also the movement you're about to see is starts at the spacecraft and, and goes upwards and outwards. So once I'd found that, and I will play this video in a moment, what was then important to say is, well, where is this movement? And of course, because it's in silhouette, we can't see where the hatch is. So the start of this film, you'll see Gus coming out of the spacecraft and you say, well, why is Gus there at this moment? I've done that because I superimposed that later bit of footage onto, this, onto the capsule so that we can see, we can see where his legs go into the capsule and therefore we know exactly where the hatch is. So I'll just play this. So there's Gus, the arrow is where the hatch is. And then that's the 17 frames and in reverse. And then play it again. How would you see that dark matter? I think it's more clear in reverse. You can almost see this being sucked back into the spacecraft. And of course, in forwards, it's going out from the spacecraft. So I'll play it once more because this is obviously quite key. So there's the hatch. That's forwards. And then backwards. And forwards. And backwards so i thought okay it, it's it's low quality film it's not much but that 17 consecutive frames from the exact location of the hatch so this was obviously of interest that's moved on so taking one of those frames so what this consists of is generally a smaller darker something could be a hatch amongst why more dispersed, slightly darker something, which I think is ocean spray. So that's important because that would corroborate Grissom's statement as well. That he said, as soon as the hatch blew, water started to come over the sill. And if you notice, the spacecraft is listing quite severely, and that's due to the, the prop wash from the helicopter. So that corroborates what he said is that, that the bottom of the hatch would probably be in under the water line which is why we would then see this tumbling effect of the hatch. It's not a direct curve, it kind of tumbles and it would have be surrounded by this ocean spray. And it also doesn't travel very far. And Reinhardt thought that it landed about five feet from the spacecraft, which is why we, we see it relatively close. So all that starts to tie in. What also ties in is 5.2 seconds after this, we see the first sign of Grissom we just see his head start to come out of the hatch. So again, he said, I never, as soon as that hatch blew, I saw a blue sky, I saw water come over the sill and I've never moved quicker. So thinking through his, how he got out, it was very difficult to get out, but he was five foot four and he grabbed the instrument panel and 5.2 seconds seems reasonable. So things are starting to tie in. But 
crucially, what's happening with Hunt Club One at this moment? Because Ryanard said, when I reached out with the pole and I cut the antenna, that's when I saw the arc, my squibs went off, and at that moment, the hatch blew. So if this is static and it was caused by that moment, if this is the hatch and it's looking very likely, we want to see, can we see Reinhard reaching out, snipping that antenna at that moment? This is a stilled frame. I've enhanced this in a different way to try and pull as much detail out of that silhouette, which is quite difficult. And unfortunately, there's very little detail in a single frame. And Hunt Club One looks quite a way away from the capsule. So that's when I decided to apply this stacking technique. Like I say, I use it a lot in the book, used it on the Armstrong image, and it's an incredibly powerful technique for pulling detail out of moving film. So if you imagine this, well, this is 16 millimeter film. If you imagine this was done digitally, if you imagine doing it in an analog way, if you snipped those four separate frames and stacked them, as you can see here, and aligned the image on each frame and then consolidated them, the image, which is the signal, is in the same place on every frame, but noise on an image, which is the enemy, is on is completely random on every frame. So by consolidating them, you effectively keep the signal, but you average out the noise. And then you can see the image more clear, it becomes more photo-like, and you can pull more detail out. So I took the 17 frames that we see the hatch tumble, a few extra frames either side, so it can cover about one second of elapsed time and lots of frames. The more frames, the better for this technique. Uh, process that, and we went from this single frame to this frame, to this image. So as you can see, I can pull out much more detail. We can almost re read Marines here. We can see the logo here, and here's the doorway of Hunt Club One, and lo and behold, there's Ryanard. There's his hat. This is his, cat, his uh, life vest. I'm assuming you can see my cursor. This is his right elbow holding the back of a pole and his left arm outstretched. And here is a pole. And you can see it's going towards the direction of the spacecraft. But frustratingly, as we have a lighter background, we can't see where it, where it continues. But this is now looking really interesting. We can see Ryanard. He is holding a pole at the moment we've seen the hatch tumble away. So all I did was superimpose a line through what we could see to see where it would intersect the spacecraft. And it happens to intersect an area above the spacecraft where we know the antenna was cut. And we can see that this is a, the inset image is a later part of the recovery. And he snipped, he left about two foot of the antenna. And there is exactly where he's pointing about two foot above the spacecraft. The next question is, he looks quite a long way away. Could he really have reached at that moment? So to look at that, the image on the right, you may notice is much better quality. That's because we're now clo filmed closer to the, to the action. But I rescaled that, and this is the shepherd's hook pole. So using the logic that the shepherd's hook pole, which is used to hook onto the spacecraft, is the same length as the cookie cutter pole, I basically took that, measured it, moved it across to the image, and it is long enough. So this, once I found this, it was like, well, this, is, this really is looking like it, it's it. You know, we've found 17 frames that can't be filled by artifacts that come from the exact location of the hatch. And at that exact moment, we can see Ryanard in Hunt Club One, pointing a pole exactly where we know the antenna was cut. So it could be an absolutely extraordinary coincidence but it would be an extraordinary coincidence. So just before we get on to some conclusions, I've just thought I'd show you some more footage. This is Grissom entering the water. So this is, again, this is stabilised, enhanced footage. Nothing to do with the analysis necessarily, but if you want to see what happens next, and he's holding on to think some uh, cables that are just close to the instrument panel as he goes into the water. We think it might be bobbing up here, his helmet. Mm -hmm. And then in this footage, this kind of really captures the drama of the recovery. I'm going to play this twice. If you keep your eye on Grissom, who's in the water, you'll see that he actually swims towards the spacecraft. 
puts his hand on the top of the spacecraft as if, you know, if you can't hook on, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to latch that spacecraft for you. Very brave. The spacecraft's sinking, but he swims towards it to try and help. And then when they're latched on, you'll see him swim away and give the kind of the double thumbs up to the, to the recovery guys. So there he is. They're now hooked on. He moves away and he gives the, you know, you are, you're latched on. So he was desperate to recover his spacecraft, of course. I'll play it one more time. If you look at Hunt Club 1, you'll see Ryanard hook on. Hunt Club 1 takes off and you'll see the line tighten and you'll see the jolt that the, that the helicopter takes because of the weight of the spacecraft. It's now full of water, of course. And then he waves Grissom away with his left hand. So there he is reaching out. He's just hooked on with the pole. Grissom says, yeah, you're on. Hunt Club 1 goes up, and then now you'll see the helicopter get that jolt. And he waves Grissom away. So in terms of the conclusion, what we were trying to do is corroborate Ryanard's statement that as he cut the antenna, the hatch blew. So we have now found what we think is the hatch. Like I say, it's, it's not film artifacts. It's not super definitive. You can't say that is categorically a hatch. But the fact that it's in 17 frames, it's from the, the exact location of, of the hatch. 5.2 seconds later, Grissom aggresses so that the timeline fits. Water pours over the door sill. We can see that the spacecraft is listing at that moment. That fits. And at that precise moment, Brian R is cutting the antenna, which validates his statement and his time frames. So one key thing, as George alluded to, is... This scenario has been talked about before, but it tends to hit the buffers because the other eyewitness, the pilot of Hunt Club One, has always maintained that he thought the hatch blew earlier on in the process, on, in the approach. So a lot of the scenarios were kind of wiped out, if you like. But we, we uh, sent Jim this analysis, talked him through it, and he said, actually, yeah, I need to reevaluate my memory banks it does seem that this is when the hatch blows so now we have all the eyewitnesses we have gus ryan art lewis all on the same page so what we believe is electrostatic discharge from that cuticle cutter pole as it touched the antenna it set off the squibs in ryan Ard's cookie cutter and because the spacecraft was ungrounded and it set off potentially the hatch and what we found is from some kurt newport who raised liberty bell 7 from the ocean floor who knows the spacecraft very well believed that the percussion cap that set off the hatch uh, used mercury fulminate and he sent us the data sheet for mercury fulminate and it's very sensitive to static which is very telling so george i don't know if you want to well, I, I guess the other, yeah, the other thing that should be mentioned here is that so the, the, the water temperature on that day, July 21st, 1961, was about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And you've got a piston-driven helicopter uh, hovering over the spacecraft, and it's likely generating a pretty substantial vortex of an, an and probably generating a, a fair amount of static electricity. This, the standard procedure in, in this case with the Coast Guard and the Navy is you would always ground some anything before you touch it. And uh, there, were, there was evidence uh, during some of the practice runs where guys were getting zapped when they touched, when they touched the spacecraft. In fact, even the guy who designed the squib got zapped in a practice run. So they knew about this problem. And I guess the other thing I, I'd point out is that this recovery procedure was never used again. Uh, uh, John Glenn, Wally Shira, Gordon Cooper all blew the hatch on the deck. They, won. they, wanted, no, they wanted no part of this procedure because they didn't want a, a repeat of what happened to Gus. The other standard defense of Grissom is that um, the, the uh, Plunger was known to have a nasty kick. And when Wally Shira blew the hatch on Sigma 7, um, he, he got a, 
it, it cut through his glove and bruised and maybe even cut his hand. And when he walked on deck and saw Gus, he said, look what I've got on my hand. And Gus, Gus Grissom had no injuries of, of, of that type on his hand because he didn't hit the plunger. That much we know. And he probably didn't accidentally bump the plunger because of the, the location is pretty far from the couch he was, he was sitting in. So um, when you put all of these things together, we think that electrostatic discharge makes as much sense as the cause for the premature detonation of the Liberty Bell 7 hatch as anything else. And uh, this, the, the nonsense about Gus Grissom panicking at the end of his flight is a myth. It's never happened. I've listened to all of the communications and there's no indication of, of panic, merely relief. It's the opposite, so, isn't it? He, he, the Hunt Club One says, are, are you ready for us to recover? And he actually says, no, no, give me a few minutes. I've got yeah, some things I want to finish off. He was in absolutely no rush, yeah. no stress, yeah. calm. I'll give you a shout when I'm ready. And when he's ready, he said, okay. Yeah, so, yeah just there's no indication to, of panic. Yeah, just, just happy to be in the water. Yeah. So, uh, Eleanor, I think we've covered the key points. Uh, I think Andy's, again, you know, the, there's a lot of talk in space history about uh, interpreting sp space history in, in new ways. And I think that's what Andy's just showed you that, that this was, none of this was seen before last year when we published our results. And uh, we, we think it corroborates what the people who were there said they saw. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we'd be very interested in trying to test this uh, hypothesis. And Andy and I are working on something along those lines now. But uh, we'd be happy to take your questions and comments. Yeah, no, this was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um... I'm actually going to start out with a with a question, um, Andy. How did you get into this interest in digital work? And um, it's you know it's like digital reconnaissance or digital you know detective work. Um, I'm very I'm very curious about that. Um, it's just a first question. Yeah, um, I've just always had since being a child an absolute obsession with particularly the, the Apollo moon landings. Um, I'm not really sure why. <laughs> I think as a little boy, I was obsessed with rockets, like a lot of little boys were. I remember looking at the moon through a small telescope and thinking, gosh, you could almost fly there and fly over that. It became this 3D world through a telescope. Um, and then when I learned that actually people have been there, they've walked around, that absolutely blew my mind. So that I've always had this kind of childlike fascination, if you like, um, but I've always been conscious as, that something very important was missing. I wanted to see the spacecraft. I wanted to see the moon, but I specifically wanted to see Neil Armstrong on the moon. This absolutely pivotal, monumental moment in human history. I want to see him on the moon and I can't. How can I? You know, all the images are of, of Aldrin because um, Armstrong held a camera. Um, so that's when I decided to try and produce one using this stacking technique from the 16 millimeter film. So they had the, the Hasselblads and they had the 16 millimeter film. And as that, the quality of that film or the transfers of that film got better, that's when I decided to apply this technique. And that, that's just as I've got older, my knowledge of photography and digital processing improved. Um, and I decided, you know what, you can put Mars through this technique, this stacking technique. It's used in astrophotography. Why can't we put Neil Armstrong through it? So I did. And I just couldn't believe, I mean, you've seen the kind of transformation there. I couldn't believe the detail I was able to pull out. We can see his face because he is eyelid and it was recognizably Neil Armstrong. So I, I was in this office late one night, but and it was like, a, imagine if, if you were an archeologist and you're brushing the dust off some really old artifact and seeing it again for the first time. So I was just, I was hooked. It was almost like I'd gone back to 1969 and I was in the lunar module next to Aldrin, looking out that window and watching this incredible moment in history unfold. So I just got hooked from then really. Um, but then looking back at the back catalogue of all the images from Apollo, I also realised that they're really badly presented typically. 
because it's always been based on duplicate film, badly processed. We didn't have very good digital scanning technology. But that original film has recently become available. It's come out of this frozen vault in Houston. It's been scanned to an incredible resolution. So it's utilizing those scans as well. So we've got the 16 millimeter film stacking and utilizing the original film that we've now got and these super high res scans that I can start to pull out this detail and represent these, a lot of them, a lot of the iconic images they're actually seen really badly. And mm. to me, that's like someone writing about Apollo 11 and misquoting Armstrong's one small step speech. You know, it just shouldn't happen. We should see these images as absolute best as we can and preserve them and, and, uh, and share them. So that's, it's an obsession. <laughs> well, we're, we're the better for it. And I can't wait for Apollo Revastors to come out in uh, October. So I'm, I already have mine reserved. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so I know there were a couple of questions on, on the chat. Um, and let's see. First, I'm going to start with uh, Dan, uh, or Dan, I don't know if you want to ask your question, um, if you want to come off mute. Uh, yeah, very, I very much enjoyed the presentation. I was just wondering what the motivation was for the present uh, presenters for vindicating uh, Gus Grissom. Well, as Andy said, this is, this is one of the great mysteries of the early space program. And I, I think that, uh, you know, my motivation was, as, as, as Eleanor said, is Gus Grissom never got to write his, his version of these things. And if you look at the, the book and the film, The Right Stuff, uh, by and large, it's, it's a pretty good book. Uh, but the, the stuff about uh, Gus Grissom at the end of his flight is myth. It simply didn't happen. Um, so, you know, Wolf had a, a, a protagonist and it was uh, Chuck Yeager and it was John Glenn. Well, he needed a foil and it turns out that I think Gus Grissom turned out to be a convenient foil if for no other reason he was dead and he wasn't there to defend himself. Um, you know, the, the, uh, Wolf kind of considered Grissom to be a hick and I uh, couldn't string a, a sentence together. And these things were not true. Gus didn't say much, but when he did say something, they listened because he knew what he, they knew that he knew what he was talking about. So I wanted to, to in the course of my research, I wanted to uh, find out what happened. And I read the transcripts and I listened to the air to ground and I just thought this, this is absurd, this never happened. Now in the course of my research, I ran into a guy named Rick Booz, who you may know, uh, may have heard of, Rick died of COVID a couple of years ago, but we yeah. couldn't have gotten started on this without him. He interviewed John Reinhardt and he played the tape in which Ryan, John Reinhardt said twice that when I touched the whip antenna, I saw an arc. And when I saw the, right after the arc and my, the squibs fired, I saw the hatch come off. So this led us to, okay, um, uh, you got all of this prop wash over the spacecraft, 80 degree water, you know, what could, a, could an electrical charge go front down, down the antenna and to the hatch and blow it, which was armed. And, at first, when I looked at Andy's work, I thought, oh, gee, it looks like the helicopter is too far away. It's certainly closer than uh, what Jim Lewis said. He said they were on final, final approach when the hatch blew. And Andy shows that that's not the case. But when we, you know, we uh, extended that, that pole, it reaches that 16 foot long whip antenna. So we think that electrostatic discharge is as plausible an explanation as to what happened as any other. There, there are other uh, possible uh, causes. Gus Grissom and others believe that the, the, uh, the lines from the parachutes might have caught in, in an exterior lanyard that they, they could use to blow the hatch from the outside uh, and it required about 40 pounds of pressure to activate it. But it's, as, as Andy's noted, it's a very small little device. And it's not clear that those, 
those lines actually could have got caught in it. So uh, that's been proposed. And NASA tried to find the cause. They looked at snake circuits and, and these things, and they couldn't come up with anything. And they were just in a hurry. They wanted to move on and get an orbital flight, which, which Glenn did uh, a couple of months later. Um, but they, in trying to, to investigate what happened, they were never able to recreate the conditions on July 21st, 1961, with, with this you know, piston-driven helicopter hovering over a spacecraft in 80-degree water and nothing's grounded. Um, and you know, Andy's pictures show what, what we think happened and, and a likely explanation as to why uh, the hatch blew prematurely. And, uh, Sorry. Part and, of that investigation, NASA had Gus back in a, in a spacecraft and they're trying to see if he could have accidentally hit the plunger. But it was just, it was kind of, it was such an awkward, difficult place to get to. They concluded that it couldn't have hit it accidentally. Yeah, very unlikely. Because that, that was another scenario is that maybe he accidentally hit the plunger. Yeah. If I can follow up, does, is there an official explanation that NASA uh, puts forth? Um, and if so, or if not, would you fellows offer your explanation to NASA? Would they consider it? No, I've, no, I've not seen a, it's, it's like Apollo 1. The, the, there's no definitive answer. And I, and I think they looked uh, at as much as they could and decided just to move on. And what basically what came out of this is they changed the recovery procedures and they never used this this procedure again. There was a lot. There were a lot of things going on. You had uh, they were in the middle of Mercury. They were cranking up Gemini, and they were, they were in the process of moving to Houston from from Langley. So they were in a big hurry, and they just decided we wanted to move along. But what? The, but the other part of this with the astronauts is that, and we made that point earlier, is that fault tended to go towards towards the astronaut and not the engineers and not the managers. And uh, the next, I guess, Grissom had to go through a press conference. And as I mentioned, he said at one point he was scared and some reporter said, you were what? And he said, I was, I was afraid. I was scared because he was afraid he was gonna drown. And that got misconstrued by the press. And basically for the rest of Gus Grissom's life, he had to live with what he called the hatch crap. But, I, but the, you know, the bottom line is, I, I think that they understood that he didn't panic. He was highly qualified. He got the maiden flight on Gemini. And 18 months later, he got the maiden flight on Apollo. And most test pilots wouldn't get the maiden flight of a vehicle once in their lifetime. And he got two in two years. So I think that uh, once he got through this ordeal, he sort of made a comeback and they realized you know, this guy could be one of the first uh, uh, astronauts on the moon. Somebody asked whether Gus would have been first, not necessarily. It depended on, if you recall, you know, seven's got to get to orbit, eight's going to go to the moon, nine tests the lunar module, 10 goes to the moon but doesn't land, and then 11 just happens to be at the right place at the right time. So, you know, and, and with the crew rotations, who knows what it would have been. But Slayton wanted um, a Mercury guy to be f to have the first crack if if things had worked out. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. had he lived, Gus Grissom would have walked on the moon. Whether he would have been the first, we don't know. Mm. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. You know, George. Actually, you know, talking about the the comment Gus made about I was scared and it was you know yeah I mean of drowning. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, yeah. a bit of a facetious thought of thinking, no, he wasn't scared of drowning. He was scared of Chris Kraft. But, yeah, it, right. but, it, but it's interesting that, you know, I, I, you know, we certainly know about Carpenter falling out of favor, you know, for various reasons during Mercury with, with Kraft after his flight. And I think to some extent, John Glenn as well with him not mm -hmm. flying again, you can argue that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's interesting that after this happened, you know, he Gus did not fall out of favor, if you will, and got those those other yeah. really prominent yeah. flights. You know, one one thing one thing you have to remember is these guys were were superstars. 
you know, they a lot of a lot of Americans thought this guy's going to get blown up on live on television, you know. And so if they came back, you know, they they got a ticker tape parade. Although Gus Grissom did not, but um, they definitely, you know, his this Liberty Bell Seven and Carpenter's flight definitely sort of took the astronauts down a peg. And and the 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 control sort of shifted towards Kraft and and Kranz and the guys who were who were calling the shots. If you recall, John Glenn was not told that his that they thought his heat shield had come loose because they didn't think uh, he needed to know it. And uh, later on, he said, "No, I I definitely needed to know that." And when he asked, "What is your reason?" they wouldn't tell him. So there was a lot of friction between, you know, a worker and management here. But, you know, the bottom line is that these guys are putting their rear ends on the line. So yeah. um, you got to consider that. You know, another comment that you made was that perhaps something that could contribute, have contributed to this was uh, some degree of unfamiliarity with rescue, that that was not, right. there wasn't as much practice or whatever yet it seems that there was an intense amount of focus on that up leading into shepherd's flight um, where they, you know, figured out all these techniques and the shepherd's hook and um, yeah. all that. But I guess that sort of, they eased up on that a bit once it, it worked. Well, much, yeah, so. I, I think this was, I think this was a step function more complicated because they wanted to come out through the hatch. Mm -hmm. So you had, you know, everything had to be, you had to follow the checklist. And I, you know, was, the others have said Gus got out of sequence. Well, I don't necessarily think that that's true because he simply didn't practice these parts of it. I mean, they were running three, four, five hundred simulations of the actual flight, and it was only near the end of the training before his before the scheduled launch that he actually saw that the hatch. Uh, and and how it operated. Mm. So uh, and and you know you, and you can it isn't clear that the thing was actually man rated when they put when they put it on the spacecraft. Bob Voss, who helped select the astronauts, was was very uh, uh, firm on this point that there was inadequate training for the recovery procedures that they were attempting on this flight, and it's one reason they never used them again. Of course, Shepard didn't have an explosive hatch, so this was the first time the explosive hatch was right. being used. Right. Yeah. And it's important, of course, to remember the context and the global climate at the time of the US desperately trying to catch up with, with Russia. And as George says, I guess the focus really is let's get moving, let's get the next mission going, explosive hatch, right? Let's get them up, get them back. Whereas once they're in the water, you could kind of understand if anything kind of slips, then it may be that, re that, that those recovery procedures. But it was mm -hmm. the first time the explosive hatch had been used. Yeah. And how were they doing egress then? How, I, I just can't recall. I know there was some practice of like going out through that upper part of the of the capsule. Um, but I'm, how were they actually accomplishing egress? Well, that was, yeah. Uh, they actually wanted Glenn to come out the top and he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I want you to haul me to the NOAA and and I'll blow the hatch on the deck, and okay. then of course Carpenter, because he overshot his 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 recovery zone, ended up going out the top. That was the only astronaut who did that. But but then Shara and Cooper both blew the hatch on the deck, and Andy's found footage showing how, how they they used the external lanyard to blow it. Huh. Okay. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah. There was a question. Paul Tolsma on chat actually had a question that uh you know again yeah, about, about tom wolf and and is any of that true about having the souvenirs and all of that that you see oh, yeah all all the astronauts and even the guys from um mcdonnell aircraft who made the spacecraft were were stashing dollar bills signed dollar bills all kind of mementos inside the spacecraft because you know then it would have been flown yeah gus grissom had a role of um Liberty dimes in one of his suit pockets. And the reason he was losing buoyancy was not so much the weight was, but because he had forgotten to close the oxygen inlet in his suit. And it's understandable since he, 
he barely managed to get out of the spacecraft. But the, the recovery guys thought, well, he's got enough buoyancy in his suit to float. Don't worry about him. Let's get the spacecraft. But he was actually losing buoyancy. He had gotten his uh, neck dam up, but he was still taking in taking on water. And after about four and a half minutes, he was fighting for his life. He was fighting to keep his literally keep his nose above water. And the first, you know, the first thing he said when when he got hauled aboard the uh, backup helicopter was, "Give me something to blow my nose with." Wow. Um, I have a question. When it's, when it's time. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, what would have been the procedure to keep the spacecraft from sinking? Would, would divers have put a, a flotation collar on, yeah. on on the spacecraft before they blew the hatch? That was one of that was one of the changes that was made starting with Glenn's flight. No, so, no, but, but for this flight, what would it have been? No, Just, no, there was there was nothing like the like the flotation devices. No, that wasn't part of the recovery procedure. Those things were added afterward. Well, then how would how would he have gotten out of the spacecraft? In this he case? would have blown the hatch once the once the uh, helicopter lifted the sill above the waterline, and they would have had a horse collar there waiting for him. And presumably, he could grasp it, pull it on, and they and they'd lift him into the helicopter. But the helicopter would have kept the the uh, the spacecraft from sinking until the ship picked it up. Well, they tried to, but uh, uh, Lewis. But if water got into it. But if, yeah. if water hadn't got into it, then how would they? Yeah, yeah. Then, then they how would they have, have kept as the, as the, with the other Mercury flights? The helicopter would have hauled it back to the carrier. Yeah. Okay. So they would have blown the hatch after they would hook. If it, if it had all gone correct and the hatch hadn't blown, the hatch stayed on. They would have hooked on, which they managed to do. But of course, in this instance, they hooked on when Liberty Bell 7 was full of water. So if they hadn't have blown the hat, if the hatch hadn't have blown, they'd have hooked on and lifted it just enough above the water line, and then the hatch would have been blown. And then they'd carry it and drop it on the carrier. Oh, okay, got it. If it oh. had gone correct. Yeah. And the, the helicopter would have picked up the, the, uh, the, the, the castle? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. So okay. UH-34... But, you know, with with sufficient lifting power, but once uh, once it filled with water, that was over with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. About, yeah. about an additional three thousand pounds, and Lewis got a, a warning light, and at that point, they gave up and cut bait. Now there was, yeah, Dan had a question actually online as well about what happened to Liberty Bell Seven. Was it ever recovered? And I know that story, but it thought occurred to me: Did they ever find the hatch? No. Uh, so, so Kurt Newport spent 18 years going over uh, uh, charts and, and trajectories, and he got the Discovery Channel to fund an expedition. He's a salvage expert, and he went out and identified objects in the area. Said, "Let's look here," and they did their uh, their lawnmower thing, and they came up with about a dozen likely targets. But they were they were running out of time and money, and he, he they Discovery Channel gave him one more shot, and he said, "Well, let's start with Target Seventy One. It looks the most promising." And I don't know if anybody's seen it; it's really dramatic. All of a sudden, in sixteen thousand feet of water, his ROV, his robotic vehicle, pulls up, and it says "United States" on this object, and he found it. And what what so once they located it, then he had to figure out how to get it back up. And Kurt knew enough about the structure that he built a device to attach to the recovery com uh, compartment to lift it up. So when they went back to lift it up, he was given bad um, uh, location, and they had to waste a lot of time refinding the spacecraft. And Discovery Channel said, this is it. Um, you know, try to get the thing up. So he lost the chance to find the hatch. The hatch was never recovered. Ah, bummer. Uh, and and one of the reasons, um, uh, the one of the procedures was that you would Gus would have attached stringers to the hatch so it wouldn't come off. It would just it would blow. Off, it would fall off. It would explode and fall off. 
But on the way down, he said, I've tried and I tried and I can't get the pin in to keep the hatch connected to the spacecraft. So he hits the water, he's got to do other things. Nobody's anticipate, anticipating what's going to happen next. And the hatch was lost and Kurt ran out of time and money and was never able to find it. Uh -huh. But he did find the spacecraft. It was restored and it's now in at the Cosmosphere in Kansas. Yeah. Um, I, well, you know, I want to, uh, two other questions. So, you know, the last time we had you in Warminster, George, um, we also had a lot of discussion about Apollo 1. And um, are you going to be writing a book about Apollo 1? I think we asked you then, so I didn't know if anything has changed since then. Well, um, I, we continue to, to scour the archives and to uh, try to shake loose primary sources like the audio channels from the day of the fire. I'm in touch with a young man named Matthew Bettingfield. Uh, some of you may recognize the, the name Bettingfield. He's not related to Sam Bettingfield, who used to run the shuttle program. But Matthew's grandfather is a guy named James Gleaves, who was a Nash, uh, North American aviation technician on pad 34 on the night of the fire and helped get the hatches off. And Matthew's been digging. He's an attorney here in DC and he's been digging. He's contacted me, we're, we're, uh, we're digging. And at some point we may try to write a definitive account of the fire. Hmm. So stay tuned. We, you know, that's yeah. everybody, and Andy's going to find out this too. What's your next book? So that that may be, but uh, we don't have a publisher yet. But we're digging. It's been very difficult um, to get into these archives over the last two years. There's a great deal of information at the NASA archives in Fort Worth. Uh, the last time we tried to get into the National Archives, which has all of the information on the on the uh, on the investigation. Um, it takes three months to get in, so it's going to be a slow process. But, uh, you know, we're filing Freedom of Information Act requests to get at some of the primary sources and, uh, you know, would like to write a definitive account at some point. Well, I hope, uh, I hope that eventually can happen, so yeah, definitely. And Andy, uh, what's, what projects are you working on now? I mean, after, of course, you know, the big splash with Apollo Remastered, Will be in the fall, but uh, I'm sure you probably are doing something for an encore. Um, after that, yes, I'd like to look at Gemini. So there hasn't really been a, a good photo book on Gemini to date. Um, and they actually had a different camera. They had a, uh, for the latter missions particularly, is the Hasselblad Super Wide, which had a wide angle lens. So it was great at capturing the inside of the capsule. And when they went on the EVA, the capsule and the backdrop of Earth. And the photographs are just absolutely just stunners, you know, aesthetically. And of course, it'd have a very different look to Apollo. Apollo, predominantly moon, of course. This would be predominantly shots of Earth. So, uh, yeah, Gemini remastered, I would hope, would be next. And it would make a nice collection then. I would love that because I personally think Gemini, yes, I agree. I mean, some of the iconic pictures of the early space age come from Gemini and Particularly, mm -hmm. I always think of, of course, Gemini 4. and Gemini 4, Ed White. And, and then that was a turning point in NASA's appreciation for, for space photography, really. I mean, up until then, the, the public affairs side of things wasn't very high on the agenda. But once they saw those images, a human form against a backdrop like that that really captured the imagination of the public, you know, in terms of getting continued congressional support and... The, the money, they'd started to plow a lot more money into training, uh, into the camera equipment. So that was an absolute turning point in, in space photography, really, was Gemini 4. And some incredible, you know, achievements. It's, it's often stuck, isn't it, really, in between Mercury, the first ever space flights, and Apollo went to the moon. It's that little kind of uncomfortable middle brother, if you like. Uh, <laughs> so it often doesn't get the kind of attention that it should. So yep. it'd be nice to shine a, shine a new okay. spotlight on. Gemini. And the Gusmobile. <laughs> and the Gusmobile, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. I didn't see anything else on chat, so. All right. 
Well, I think we can we can call it an evening I, and a very late evening because they morning a, a, or morning now <laughs> since he's over in the UK. And, you know, again, we very much appreciate uh, the late night uh, no to come and present to our, our group. And George, as always, a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks um, again for reworking your schedule to, to yeah. accommodate uh, Andy's uh, Andy's publishing duties. Yeah, yeah no, thank you. No. No problem at all. So um, I think we can we can call it an evening. And uh, again, thank you again. Hope you guys have a good rest of the summer. And I don't know if that, if either of you are going to be in Oshkosh, but I'm actually going to brave it and drive out to Oshkosh uh, this year to uh, see the show. I haven't been there in a couple of years. So. Oh, you'll have a great time. Yeah, it's a, it's the best. Well, so. Eleanor, it was great being back with you again. Yeah, maybe we, it's sometime when you write the Apollo one book or when Andy has his Gemini book to out, maybe we can actually bring you to Warminster live. Wow. That would be fun. Yeah. yeah. Andy needs to see it. You need to see the centrifuge. <laughs> yeah. Must see it. Yeah. It's on the list. All right. Well, very good. All right. Well, thanks again. And, and again, join us in July um, for our next uh, webinar with John Ramirez, who's going to be uh, talking about Clint, uh, about some work that was done uh, and, uh, at Penn State. Um, and I, I, I want to make, I know, John, I don't know if you're still on. I want to use the correct terminology. Um, can I say clandestine? Can I say, you know, confidential work that was done there during the Cold War? Uh, but uh, very much looking forward to that as well. So uh, thanks again. You'll see those announcements coming out in a few weeks. And uh, that's it. So good night, everybody. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Good, Good night. Good morning.